Hello everyone. Now just a quick note at the top to say a couple of things. This podcast was recorded way back on February 16th, so I was a little out of date regarding Omicron and also Volvo News Network. Stand by for a bit's flash at the end of the podcast. Also, I just wanted to lay out here a bit of a trigger warning around cancer and comedy. Some people find those two things hard to mix, but this is Lana's story, her cancer, and her comedy. So I'm giving her the space to talk about that and also abortion. But if those topics are emotionally charged for you, please be aware they are coming. But now, back to the show. everyone, kia ora tato, haere mai, and welcome along to Showy Ovaries, a podcast where I, provocatively prodding the zeitgeist of perimenopause, Penny Ashton, delve into just what might happen to all of our bits and pieces before they sputter out into well-earned retirement. A quick reminder, as always, that I am not a doctor, though in my continuing series of school certificates, here's another one from St. Joseph's Primary School, Papua Nui, signed by Sister Mari in 1980. Congratulations to Penny Ashton for being a helpful, happy girl and for doing extra homework at home. That's right, age six. So I may be a proud girly swat, but if you want actual proper medical advice from people who swatted and then sat proper medical exams, please do seek a proper medical professional. Today's guest might not be a doctor, but she has spent a fair amount of time in doctor's offices dealing with a diagnosis of breast cancer. She's an actor, a puppeteer, a comedian, was a Grecian statue when I first saw her something like 17 years ago, uh, has pivoted into a public health role in emergency management and is beaming into us today from that most locked down city in the world, Melbourne, Australia. Hello, please welcome my good friend, Lana Schwartz. Hello. Oh, good day, good day all the way from Melbourne, Australia. Yeah, it's so funny, like my Australian accent is so good, isn't it? Yeah, I know. Your, your strine could not be beat. I know. It's like I can do I can do Southern American. I can do all these other accents, like better. English accents, all that sort of stuff, much better than Australian. How's your Look, New Zealand? I can't do a Kiwi accent for sure. Sh- like, no. I just can't. Just It's too close. I think it must be the same sort of thing. Like, yeah. It's too close. I think the closest I get to it is chups and that's it, you know. Chups. Anyway, enough of that. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Oh, you know, I'm just trying to avoid ex-tropical cyclone Dovey right now. So if we hear any sort of rambunctious noises, that's what that is. It's not my stomach. But how is it all going over? So now we're at the beginning of our Omicron wave. Today there were 810 cases. And I presume by the time this goes to air, it'll probably be a lot worse here. But what's it been like coming out the other end? Uh, Look, I haven't uh, left my house for... (laughs) Just haven't, I'm too scared. <laughs> I know, I know yeah. it's meant to be. Look, you know, I am, I so far have not said one full sentence, but um, <laughs> I know I just have many, many feelings about it and they're all coming to the fore of my head at the same time. I basically, I'm triple boost, um, triple vaxxed. So, you know, really it shouldn't have too much of an, an issue for me. But like I now, as you mentioned, I've pivoted completely out of the, the, the public <laughs> And so I'm now just working from home in the, in my little study and not really going out too much. We, I did do a show, but I was a puppeteer at the time and I was masked the whole time and, you know, so... Um, yeah, now this is your Shakespeare crossed with aliens. That's right, it was Shakespeare right. aliens, yes. And how did it go? It was great. Like, it was so stupid. Um, <laughs> that's my favourite <laughs> thing in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, is, is, you know, doing things for, like, stupid sake. Did you say, get away from her, you strumpet, or something at some point? Oh, that would have been great. No, <laughs> we, we actually said, get away from her, you bitch. That's the, oh, um, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Right, okay. the, the audience said it at that time, but... It, 
you know, uh, that would have been right. a really great thing to. Mm. I am pondering a new Shakespeare show, but now I haven't actually seen your face. I don't think to actually give you commiserations about Tyson. So, oh yeah, my beautiful yeah. boy. Yeah, this is what you wrote on your website. It might make me cry. And I'm like, you know that I'm not a dog person at all. But it says she is a proud mother of an adorable Labrador whose name is Tyson. But you might think his real name is I love you. Oh yeah. <laughs> He was, was like, he was with me for, he was with me for 16 years. So it's a third of my life. Yeah, man, totally. Like, I mean, I met him quite, he spooned you a lot. I saw him spooning oh, you sometimes. Yeah, 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 yeah. We spooned each other. And yeah, that's, you, it was totally, yeah. I lost a lot of boyfriends. Um, <laughs> Cause they were like, I cannot sleep with this heft on my legs. It's just. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I just thought that that was, um, I thought that was a really sweet thing to say. And also because, and this is a bit of a segue, without him, you might not have had your breast cancer diagnosis. That's absolutely true. So it was all because I was walking him in the park and met a, a, quite an amazing person, actually, who um, was on a mission to basically stop every single woman that she met in the dog park that day and say, go and get a, go and get a mammogram. <laughs> right. And how old were you then? Uh, I was 40 at the yeah, time. Yeah, wow. So you were, is that, because uh, in New Zealand it's 45 for mammograms, is free ones, is it the yeah. same there? So it's actually what they do is they advertise that it's 50 and above, oh. but sort of don't really, it's a bit of a secret, an open secret that they will test anyone over the age of 40 for free, but it's only, you wouldn't know that. Mm. Because oh. it's um it's only advertised for 50 and above, but they will test you so this woman stopped you in the park and said please go and get a mammogram and you that's thought, right why and, not and I just was like you know what I'm depressed right now what else have I got to do and oh. I, I really was like I was I, it's not me making fun of you know a mental health issue I really was I was very very low at the time mm. and I was still at that point where I was trying to get myself I, I could feel myself sliding basically further and further down that rabbit hole of depression and mm. and because I was conscious of it I was trying to do little practical things with my day to help me feel more connected to the outside world and I had done everything by that point or my teeth had been cleaned and I'd <laughs> had my you know my, and everything had been waxed and I'd had my hair done. like it was just that that whole thing of having an appointment to connect with someone yeah were you single at the time I was single at the time. So you think you might as well get your breast squeezed by someone. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> and I was like, ah, you know, uh, a mammogram. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, <laughs> that's something I can do. And um, you see you how know, flat these things go. That's the thing that astonishes me. <laughs> no. So fucking flat. It's frightening how yeah. flat they get them. Yeah, so that was basically it. And, and certainly when I made the show, a lovely lady lump based on that experience, which is now finished. I don't even talk about the depression part of it. It was just like, it was something to do, you know. Right. I was, <laughs> was so and then, oh, great. That's a good idea. A mammogram, something extra to do. Fantastic. Okay, good. And thank God. And then they found your breast yeah, cancer. Yeah, yeah. And then um, amazingly, they found the cancer and I was no longer depressed. It was very strange. It was. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna I'm gonna ask you some more questions about that, but what well, you've yeah. kindly provided some audio from your show, Lovely Lady Lum. Yeah. So through the magic of technology, we're gonna play that now, uh, and then come back afterwards and and talk about it. So here we go. Here's a little snippet of Lovely Lady Lump, and this was recorded actually at the Dunedin Comedy Gala, and you're being introduced by Ben Hurley, I believe. I can recognize the man's <laughs> voice. So here it comes. Now, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the stage, all the way from Australia, a wonderful performer, Lana Schwartz. Do you know, I've been um, researching baby names recently. Um, <laughs> I'm not expecting a baby, by the way. I just figured I should probably know what to call it if I ever met one. And uh, there's a very popular new girl's name in America at the moment, Nevaeh. I don't know if you've heard of it. I hadn't. Uh, it actually spells heaven backwards. I know. It's beautiful. Imagine the parents of this child loved this child so much they called it heaven backwards. My name's Lana. I wish my name backwards spelt heaven. It's 
suppose anal does spell heaven to some people. <laughs> and, you know, cancer, right? It's, it's a lot like sex, isn't it? Yeah? It fucks you. <laughs> Only joking. No? Cancer's nothing like sex at all, is it? It's certainly nothing like my sex life. God, if it was anything like my sex life, I wouldn't have cancer. not for a long time <laughs> and when you first get diagnosed a number of thoughts run through your brain and the first thought that ran through my brain was oh oh well fuck doing my tax then <laughs> the Australian tax office can fuck right off you want me come get me you might want to bring a shovel <laughs> oh, my parents hate that joke by the way they hate it probably as much as you did um, <laughs> They really hate it. They can't stand thinking about me not doing my tax. <laughs> Hooray, so there we go. That's for, thank you very much. That was Lana Schwartz doing a little extract from Lovely Lady Lumps. So thank you for that. But now what I'm going to do, I've got my big long introduction, and then we're going to come back and ask you some of those questions I've been asking everybody else. So here we go. Lana Schwartz is an entertainer, a circus artist, comedian, and a writer, performer of some provocative solo shows on such lightweight subjects as her breast cancer, abortion, and childlessness. She is a second-generation Australian and a direct descendant of numerous Holocaust survivors. Three out of four grandparents were in the Holocaust. She is a puppeteer extraordinaire, having studied with Henson Studios and even working on Sesame Street as a Muppet Wrangler, which is one of life's better job titles. Her short film, Sir Dance a Lot, won an award of merit in the Best Shorts Film Festival. And her solo show, Lovely Lady Lump, has won a plethora of awards, including Best Theatre at the Dunedin Fringe, Best Solo Show at the Ottawa Fringe, and the Fuck the Patriarchy Award at the Winnipeg Fringe. She and I I have toured to countless festivals together in numerous countries over <clears throat> 15 years, and I'm very glad that she didn't die of cancer. So please welcome again, Lana Schwartz. Hey. Kia ora, kia ora, kia ora. Hello, hello, hello. Now, you know, because you've pivoted into to public health now. Yes. So how are you feeling? Are you missing all, all of the, I mean, we're all missing it because there's none of it to be done. So, you know, well mm. done, good pivot. But are you missing that part of your life? I am and I'm not. I'm not missing the risk and enormous amount of work that goes behind it all. I don't know what you I, mean. I'm getting I paid am... massively for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I, I feel sad that I sort of just started to get into the groove of the last show, which was brand new, and then ran home so that I could panic by. Uh, so I did the Terminator, which, as you mentioned, was about abortion, and you saw. <laughs> I, I did. You, were, you saw. You saw it in a very small audience. I did, <laughs> but you were very appreciative. I was. It was great. That season was a part of the development, so you know I feel sad. Yeah, yeah, and and you would like to think that the abortion, you know, the fact that it's still so relevant is so galling to me that mm. it's still under threat and so much under threat particularly in the States, obviously, uh, and it was yeah. a very pertinent show for that reason. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I can't believe that it was still that relevant by the time I was doing it So, because it took a couple of years. I wanted to make sure that I didn't um, – it was really important for me that I actually got it right. You wanted to provoke um, people. I wanted to provoke thought. Yes, you know, absolutely. Um, and create metaphor for a bunch of things. Mm. And, and, you know, so I felt I, – I do feel sad – that that's, you know, I've got that show that's just kind of hanging there. Mm. And because it's been two years, it would take a while for me to, you know, get it back up to scratch. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm ready to trust the risk environment at this point. Point. No, no. And from just a fresh round of cancellations in New Zealand, I, I feel you. Absolutely. Yeah. But actually now that show along with your other show um, plays into a little bit with my first question that I've been asking everybody, which is what has your relationship with your body been like in your life and what journey has it been on? Which is a massive, massive question because you've had the, the abortion issue and the breast cancer issue and puberty and gingerhood and all those sorts of things. Mm. So um, I know. yeah, what's your answer to that question? I have a very complicated relationship with my body where I really try and love it for all of its foibles and um, and sometimes I do, sometimes I do genuinely love 
love the foibles, uh, <laughs> but I've had a long and fraught relationship with my body always and forever and I wish that I didn't I wish that it was different um, mm. but uh, certainly even now I think about what would it be like to have a breast reduction right you know maybe maybe it's time well wow. maybe it's time for that breast reduction okay you know uh, I'd have to find a spare at ten thousand dollars <laughs> but um <laughs> it's something that I have changed in my relationship to my body. Now it's not so much about how I look but how these breasts are pulling my shoulders forward and making my neck and back really tight. It's now about function right. rather than aesthetics. Uh-huh. You know, I want to be able to move well now. I've always wanted to move well but it's... But you've always been able to, right? Have you not? Yeah. So that's, is that changing now? Uh, yeah, I'm stiffening up a little bit and I, I think I am sort of changing with my in terms of my relationship to my body. At the same time, it's still the same. It's very strange. Yeah. Well, and being diagnosed with cancer, like, because sometimes I've got so much wrong with me, but I've never had anything that's that serious. I've got, mm. you know, digestive issues, asthma, epilepsy, all this sort of stuff. And then every now and then you just go, well, look, you fucking stop it, stupid body. Like, was that <laughs> massive when you got cancer? I mean, like, but then, of course, you rely on your body to, to, to fix it as well it as was, science. Yeah, of course, it was huge. It was hmm. huge. I thought I was going to, you know, I thought I was going to lose my breasts. I thought I was going to, I actually thought even after all of the treatment, I had a test to check for the Ashkenazi version of the BRCA gene. Wow. which would have meant removing my ovaries, right? So, you know, we're talking about... Sorry, can you explain to those who don't know what the Ashkenazi gene is? Yes. So the Ashkenazi Jews are Jews that sort of come mainly from the Eastern European side of the world. And you're mainly Czech? Hungarian, actually, oh. yeah. So Hungarian, Polish. Got that wrong. Yeah. Although, I, I, you know, I love Czech, but I think the Hungarians are crazier. So, uh, of course, that's where my genes come from and right. there's quite a few quite a few variations on certain things to do with Ashkenazi gene and the BRCA gene is I think it was BRCA2 from memory it was a little while ago is is a significant one and what that means if you test positive for that genetic version predisposition to breast and ovarian cancer yeah exactly ovarian cancer by the time you find ovarian cancer it's already too late essentially mostly not always but most of the time yeah. symptoms come and it's too late so it is advisable that you have an oophorectomy which is yeah. a removal of one's ovaries and I was panicked I was like I'm already on medication that is suppressing, and I know we'll talk about this in a minute, but I'm already on medication that is suppressing my hormones, but I'm not ready to lose my ovaries, right. <laughs> which was weird because I'm already talking about having a breast reduction, like get rid of some of those. Yeah. But I was worried about, you know, I was single and I was like, oh, my God, who who's going to want me now oh, honey, you know really? like oh. all those sorts of things and and the weird thing too was that I actually once I kind of announced it because uh, I was quite public you were a few days after the diagnosis I was like I think I'm going to go public about this so that I don't have to answer a million and one phone calls so I'm essentially quite lazy <laughs> Because you went off Facebook before it and then once you got the diagnosis, you came back on Facebook. Yes, that's I remember right. That. Yes, that's right. I was like, I'm coming back here to announce to you all that yes. I'm dying. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not dying. I was never dying. Mm. But, yeah, I was sort of quite public with it all. And I, what I was really shocked about was that there were a couple of guys who apparently had been admiring me from afar <laughs> who suddenly went, listen, I know you've just said this, but I'd like to take you out, you know? <laughs> and I was like, oh, 
this is not a good time. No. It's not a good time. I mean, like, um, what? That's so – I mean, I guess some people might be into that, but you're like, I'm just going to focus on not dying right now. Yeah, it was sort of this thing of um, – it did put me a little bit offside because I was like, oh, I think this is a, a knight in shining armour kind of – moment you know so you do have that and I still think the world of these people so it's not like it put me off or anything but I was just like uh no one is touching my body right now yeah yeah not for quite a long time yeah right okay I feel beaten and bruised and prodded and I it's not happening I just so you managed to have a lumpectomy and then radiation therapy and didn't have to have your ovaries removed right correct right good good and then you had to take was it what's it called again that I had to take tamoxifen so the sort of cancer that I had which is quite common is a hormonal cancer it's something that comes through having an excess of estrogen really or it's not so much an an excess of estrogen but it is promoted by estrogen in the body and it grows based on that so if you suppress estrogen then it's not that it stops the growth but you've got a much better chance of it not recurring yeah so once they remove the lump and your margins were clear etc well my margins weren't clear they had to go back they had to go back in Mm -hmm. and clear those margins so for the people who don't know what clearing of margins are you know the surgeons don't want to take too much out it's a fine balance between taking too much and not enough and it can be quite clear where the lump sits but say a surgeon has removed a ball a lump they test every cell on the external part of that lump not a single cell must have any cancer in it because if there is then there's high likelihood that it is still in your body yeah they have to then go back in and shave more out of it so they haven't cleared the margin essentially yeah which was what happened so they did have to go back in and clear that but yeah so for women who have this hormonal type of cancer and you'll have to please excuse me because it's been now eight years so I don't have the terminology at the tip of my tongue like I used to Mm -hmm. but for women who do have that sort of cancer we're usually put on a hormone suppressant drug called tamoxifen which basically suppresses your it doesn't suppress your estrogen but it stops the estrogen from entering the cells oh I see right okay so that basically crashed you into menopause very quickly it it basically crashes you into menopause so the cell it's basically they don't suppress your estrogen you're still creating estrogen but the estrogen doesn't go into the cells of your body. And so you experience menopausal type symptoms. Right, okay. So now, but so let's take one step back. Did you know anything about menopause before this? Well, I mean, you know, I've watched sitcoms where women fan themselves. Yeah, right. And so, stand no. in front of open <laughs> stand in front of open fridge doors. <laughs> Right. So but no. apart from that, no. <laughs> Did your mother talk to you about it? Did you know about her menopause? No, not at all. Not at um, all. And I'm not even sure that she necessarily had symptoms. She must have, surely? I mean, some. No, I think some people don't. Yeah, I mean, some people genuinely don't. Yeah, but it's very rare to not have a single thing. I don't think that she did. Wow, amazing. Did she, so she obviously didn't talk to you about, Was she? how was she talking about periods and all that sort of shenanigans? Oh, see, okay, so here's the thing. I reckon there's a whole book called Period, right, that we, that my mum and, <laughs> you know, mum read to me when I was a child. Oh, I don't know. There's no, book. there's no know. book. You've never seen the period book? Oh, no. my God. No. Okay, so that, that was how I learned about puberty. Right. Essentially. Right. There is no book that is the same about menopause. No. It's no. just you're just meant to know about it. Well, there is now. We have two books that have come out in New Zealand in January, both by Nikki's and both of them are coming on the podcast. So two different menopause books. So which is great. Fantastic. And it has a lot of information. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. If it's like the children's book period, then I'll be very happy. I don't, I just want to look at pictures and laugh at the cartoons. That's right. (laughs) Maybe, maybe there's a market there for you can do that on the side of your public health situation. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, obviously when I was a child that happened, but it's, it feels very sad to me that it, it still is like this 
shame, you know, mm. I mean, periods are shameful and, you know, menopause. But, you know, I think I still think that menopause is, is named incorrectly and periods are named incorrectly too. So, you know. Right. Should be, because it way? shouldn't be a pause. It's not a pause. A it actually is the period. So. Right. It's the full stop. Right, indeed. Now, yeah. so you started taking tamoxifen and then. I started taking tamoxifen. And then what? And I got very angry. Oh, you got very angry. So, what are the sub. <laughs> yeah, what, what were your symptoms? <laughs> what were your symptoms? My symptoms were I was really irrationally angry and I noted my anger but couldn't do anything about it. Couldn't stop it. I couldn't stop my reactions to things. I had no, ah, yeah, I, I had no way of, of stopping that filter, even though I knew it was unreasonable. Right, right. And yeah. who bore the brunt of that? Sadly, shop assistants. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Bastards, oh, my God. I know. I was the worst. I was the worst. I was like, oh, my God. Now, please, bearing in mind, I think that that that, that particular symptom probably equalised after a couple of months. Like okay. I learnt to deal with it. But right at the beginning I was all, like, and that, that was where that thing of like me hearing what was coming out of my mouth but not being able to control what was coming out of my mouth at the time right. was awful. I mean, mm. there was one time it really happened a lot when I was in shops and I don't know why. Mm. And I turned it into a joke in the show, but it was genuine, it was very real mm. where I would walk into a shop and just be like, I'm in a shop. I'm in a fucking shop. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's an apple. <laughs> like... <laughs> Right. I'm sorry. That's just blown your your yeah, levels. The levels are um, all out, all over the show. Yeah. yeah. I get sometimes I get annoyed, and it makes me sound like a raging snob. But when I go into shops oh. and they're like, "Hey, how's your day? What have you been up to?" and I'm like, "I have oh. friends. I don't need to talk about this with you." And then I just sound like an epic bitch. But I'm like, "No, nah, no, nah, I'm not here to have this so, chat." Yeah. yeah. So funny you should say that, Penny, because one of my the things that I'm most sad about is when I walked into a pet store and of course who works in pet stores delightful people yes who love, who their love dogs. animals yes and they're often young kids you know what did you teenagers. do what did you do <laughs> <laughs> I walked in and I was like I, you know Tyson had a very specific food that he had to eat because he was a large boy and he had to be on a diet so it doesn't you know so I walked in and I knew exactly what I was going to get and um this lovely teenage boy just comes up to me and he's so sweet and he says to me um are we after something in particular today and I <laughs> shucked an absolute tizzy over the fact that he had used the royal we Wow. Like, I was like, I was like, we are just fine. Thank you very much. We know exactly what we're going to get. And I still feel awful about it today. He was so taken aback, you mm. know. Did you apologize? And in shock. No, I kept saying, I kept saying to myself, Lana, that was inappropriate. Apologize, apologize. And then the other side of menopausal Lana was going, no, he is the royal we. Let him learn. <laughs> Right, right. Okay, good. And now, and what other sort of symptoms were you having? Just because uh, something is correlated doesn't mean that it's caused by. There's no, you know, correlation does not equal causation. Um, I did find that I got thicker around the middle, Uh, not so much fatter, just thicker. Yeah, just like somebody else said that it was like the 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 fat in their body had a party, but then forgot to go home. Mm. So yeah, it just moved. Yeah, yeah. So it's sort of yeah, really it just like it just came around the middle. Now the reason why I say it's not necessarily caused by menopause is because menopause happens at an age where we all get fat. So, but I think no, I think it often yeah. is caused by that. Though. It is about it is about the estrogen. But, but we do have to be careful that that it's not yeah. Yeah. that we don't necessarily. Like, it, it, there is such a thing as reaching your 40s, 50s, wherever, and also losing your 
metabolism a bit, you know. So there yeah, is yeah. there is that as well. But I did find that I got thicker, and I and you were quite sad about that. I remember you being. Quite I was. Sad about I couldn't that. fit into yeah. my favorite clothes. Exactly. I mean, I've got a lot of frocks that I bloody love. So that is something a little terrifying to me yeah. as a prospect. And they're still mm. they're still hanging in my cupboard because I refuse to accept. Yeah. <laughs> I can't fit into it anymore. Maybe you can sew two of them together. So you could like come one way and then be going the other way. Oh my That'd God, like, that's the best idea ever. I am I have ideas. Mm-hmm. I'm good at those. Right. So, and did you have hot flushes and all that sort of um, stuff? Yeah, I, not so much during the day. Oh, sometimes during the day, but it was mainly, mainly at night. But here's right. the thing. Now that I'm off the meds, like, it's like I've come back from the dead. Yes, yeah, so and I was going to ask about that. So, yeah. so the, all of these symptoms just got to the point where you were like, "Fuck it, I'm going to face the prospect of getting breast cancer again, rather than keep taking this." Look, after five years, after you know, they wanted me to be on it for ten years, uh-huh. but after five years, I spoke about it with my. Oh, that was the other thing that I <laughs> thinking about forgetting things. Um, that was the other the other symptom that I had. I lost my memory. Yeah, I really I lost words. I was looking for words all the time, and I couldn't find them. And yeah, it was really problematic. And it so was you had that for five years. I had that for I don't five, it was years. five years. Right. So, and you just went right. This is it. And you talked to like oncologist, endocrinologist. Yeah, I spoke to. And no, I didn't. Spe- I didn't have an oncologist because um, I didn't have chemo. But I had a surgeon who was assessing things, and and I said, look, the other symptoms I can deal with. I'm not angry anymore. It's fine. I I, I can deal with buying new clothes. It's fine. Uh, you know, the occasional night sweats. Okay, I put a fan on, but. It's the loss of my mind that was doing my head in. The loss of your mind was doing your head in. It really was, yeah. Yeah. And he was like, five years, okay. And he's like, listen, I'm really happy. Gave my breasts a bit of a feel and he said, you know, you're fine. You've been all clear on your mammograms for a long time now. This seems to have been successful for you. There's no point, have, you know, there's a point at which you've got to look at your quality of life. Yeah. And it's not as if I was eschewing Western medicine altogether. I had been five years clear already by that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And basically that bodes well. Great. Fantastic. They made a decision that it was okay for me to come off of it if I wanted to. And I was like, hey, yes, please and thank you. <laughs> And then it was like, Whoa! I don't know. I was like, it's been party time ever since. I, I'm still just as thick uh, around the middle. That hasn't gone away, but yeah, it's it's definitely sort of helped my clarity of mind. It's it's that fuzziness that happens, and you just don't realize how much your hormones are essential to yeah. the clarity of your thought. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now, so when when was it that you? So you went off it three years ago, was it? Yeah, about that. Three years ago. So now are you like living in some what a fear of the normal rate of perimenopause? Like is that playing on your mind now that I've just fed that to you? you feel <laughs> <sad>? but, <laughs> is I'm, that something you're thinking about? I'm trying to not be a feared. I'm trying to just kind of go, yep, whatever happens, happens. But it's kind of this weird thing because you're like normally menopause happens and it happens or perimenopause happens and then menopause and and it, it's it, it's done, right? Yeah, it's yeah. done. But in my case, I've come back from the dead. It's like <laughs> it's like I was in flatliners, you know. I just, I just went. I'm just going to test this for a minute, see what afterlife right. is like, and then so yeah, it's it, it's sort of a strange uh, position to be in. And um, so you basically haven't thought about it too much. I'm trying not to think about it too much. I'm I'm trying right. to kind of think. Oh well. You know, if mum didn't have many symptoms. Right. So fingers crossed. Because you can't take HRT, can you? I don't think it's a good idea for someone who has a propensity for hormonally inspired cancers. Yeah. And, of course, we're not making light of breast cancer here. You've had this conversation quite a lot, but you're just dealing with it the best way that you know how, and that is with comedy, and it's a bit the same with me. And obviously some other people have a lot harsher outcomes, but for you it's been – 
Well, you you managed to kick your depression oh, habit, yeah. and yeah, like so, did it give you like a renewed vigor for life? Yeah, it was like, oh, I have like I have cancer. I've got something to do now. That's going to keep me busy for a bit. Um, wow. Did you ever think you were going to die? You don't know. There's it, it's not so much that you think you're going to die. The problem is you don't know. Right. You don't know for so many different things you know like you have the biopsy and then you've got to wait for the results of that biopsy to come back either positive or negative and then it comes back positive and then they're like listen we're really sorry we we have to tell you it is unfortunately cancer and then you say am I gonna die and they're like we don't know (laughs) we need to find out what sort of cancer it is in order to do that you have to have surgery got to take a lymph node to make sure if that it hasn't spread and it's just from one that you don't know anything until the next thing happens and then the next thing happens and then the next thing happens and that first you have cancer that must be quite the time yeah and you know what I think it was a strange time for me because I was ready for it I had because of the depression I had been seeing a therapist so I had the biopsy I think on a Thursday and I had an appointment with my therapist on the Saturday booked in anyway to talk about the depression right I came in and I said this has happened and she's like okay let's talk about you know how you're feeling now and how you think you're going to feel when they give you the diagnosis like it was excellent right And, and it really helped calm my nerves a lot about it because she made me realize that there are three outcomes from from this. I think it was three. One is that it's not cancer. The second one is it's cancer and it's bad. And the third one is it's cancer and it's not bad. There are only three outcomes. Yeah, and you got the second best one. Exactly. And let's talk mm. about how you are going to feel with each of these three outcomes. Mm-hmm. And we talked about it. And I thought really hard about it. So then by the time it came back to doctor announcing to my parents and myself, I was like, I knew how to feel. It was very strange, but it was, I I knew how to feel. And I felt really clear and focused, unlike (laughs) unlike the menopausal, Lana, this was pre-menopausal. And I was prepared. My parents were not prepared. And they were sitting right. next to me. But, yeah, I, I sort of I knew that I had a way that I would react or feel for each one of those options. Now, and you have, have you had many people sort of thinking that you shouldn't make light of cancer or, or things like oh, that? Oh, God, have yeah. Have you had much of yeah, that? I've yeah, I've had. Yeah, which is like it's your life. So, yeah, so what have people yeah, said? Yeah, I've just had people abuse, uh, well, not, you know, they, they wouldn't do it sort of online or anything like that but certainly when I was promoting the show and you and I have done lots of flyering of um oh my god of 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 lineups at box offices around the world yes indeed and that's often when it would happen you know when you're sort of trying to say it's a comedy about breast cancer and Mm -hmm. people are like some people get it and then other people Mm. are like how dare you Mm. how dare you it's not a laughing matter. And I'm like, For me, I it mean, is. Yeah. it's about boobs. That's funny. <laughs> and the thing is, yeah, and then it was also like, well, don't come. You don't come, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. That's great. You do your thing, let me do mine, which is something that the world doesn't do very but well. But at the same time, they'll never, ever, ever forget in Edinburgh, I had these four young men turn up to my show and they sat in the front row and I came out and looked at them and I'm like, you guys are in the wrong show. <laughs> <laughs> but they and were they no they had chosen the show they stuck around and were really into it for the whole thing and I still remember that you know this guy's name was Gawain Gawain, Gawain a Welsh oh uh, yeah it's a Welsh name I'm probably pronouncing it badly but you know uh, about a year after that I got an email from Gawain saying, listen, I'm still thinking about your show. You probably thought that we were sitting there and we were in the wrong show. We weren't. We deliberately chose your show because the four of us have all been personally touched by breast cancer. For myself, it was my mum and for the other three, it was their aunties. And you really gave us a sense of 
what they would have gone through but with a light-hearted touch which was how their family members also but they they had lost them wow you know so of anybody you'd think that they would have said yeah cancer's not a laughing matter but they they needed it yeah, they well, needed it. It makes me. I'm, like, I'm such a softie. I'm like, oh, oh, cry. they were gorgeous. They were gorgeous. They really were. Yeah, and does that sort of shit just make it all worthwhile? It just makes it all worthwhile. Yeah. yeah, for you know, you get abused and all sorts of things when you do when you try and do comedy about yeah. <sighs> about uh, tough subject matters. Yeah, I mean, I get some people going, "How dare you use Jane Austen?" In that way, when you should be using it in this way. Anyway, but um, so yeah, you, you get complaints whatever you do, but yours is a little more hard. Yeah, what it, whatever you do, you, you're going to get complaints. But, um, mm. you know, I was panicked about, you know, how I promote the Terminator. <laughs> yes, your abortion <laughs> show. Oh, yes. God. Yes. That's going to be even harder than the cancer one. But yeah. Yeah, you don't like, why don't you just do one about puppies next? Hey, let's do that. Yeah. And not like, you know, puppy mills or anything, but just cute puppies. <laughs> just cute puppies. That's just all yeah. it's going to be. Just... And they call it puppy love. Yeah. And you can have a little bit of Donny Osmond playing while you're dancing. I've actually around. done it before. I did a kids' show about puppies and it failed miserably because I was like, <laughs> I, I was like, I don't feel. I'm like, why am I, what, what's the reasoning behind this show? You know, why am I making right. it? I don't, like it was fine. It was a fine show. Just You need some social justice warrior purpose to make shows. Yeah, I guess maybe I do. Yeah, I think you do, right, which is good that you're working in public health. Yes. Look at that. Yes, take, right. take me out of the entertainment arena, I say. <laughs> <laughs> No, not at all. Who would I get drunk with at pubs around the world yeah. uh, at some point? Who knows? Now, is there anything else around menopause at all that you might want to talk about? Did you find that it affected your working life at all with the brain fog and things like that? Yes, it did. And that was yeah. one of the reasons why I went back to the surgeon and I said, listen, it's really starting to affect my work. Right. And I was working at the State Library at the time and sort of trying to get some things across to executives and not really being able to find the words. But also when you're on stage and you're mucking around with the audience and you, you don't, so much of, of comedy is specificity. So mm. if you can't think of the word that you're trying to specify, yes. then it's just not funny. Yeah, this is the thing that's terrifying me as, as, a, as a prospect, you know. It might not happen, who knows. But it yeah, may not is... happen. But, you know, it was really – because you can't just, in, in the middle of a sort of an improvised whatever, you can't just go, oh, you're just like um, like um, <laughs> like the woman, oh, you know, that film in the oh, – she's – She's a prostitute and she's a, uh, Julia Roberts. You know, you can't do that, right? No, absolutely. Is there anything else you think you want to talk about at all before we get to the fun fact out of the box section? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, we should definitely talk about dry vagina. Have you not talked about dry vagina? Uh, I have, in fact, and I have potentially just started to maybe developing a slight situation. I'm calling it Vagina News Network. I'm going <laughs> to update people as I go. I've just started taking Ovestin cream. Why do you have you been partaking of such things? No, no, I haven't. But it was one of the things I think that you know when you were asking me about my symptoms, I totally, uh, ironically, glossed over. Um, yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's funny. There's something about the word. What, I can talk about other people's vaginas, but as soon as I'm talking about my vagina, it just becomes. A, I, I'm calling it sacred lady portal. Beautiful lady garden, uh, all well, this sort of stuff. I mean, really, it's the vulva we should be talking about if we want to be specific. Right? Yeah, well, I think, yeah, I'm not even really sure. And I don't necessarily think it's dry. It's just a bit irritable. It's a bit snarky. I've got a snarky vagina. Yeah, okay. So I would suggest that maybe the irritability might have something to do with a little bit of dryness. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't, it doesn't doesn't seem dry, but let's not dwell on that too much. <laughs> no, anyway. let's dwell on it. That's the... <laughs> because... <laughs> that was the thing when um when I stepped into that breast clinic at the Royal Women's Hospital and I had no idea that this was a thing, right? And I'm seeing posters up on the walls with in bold, bold big writing saying, Do you have dry vagina? Come see our 
menopause clinic on da 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 da, da. and it's all over the breast clinic of people world. taking their suppressing drugs right. well yes mm. and also because you know maybe they've had a hysterectomy and they've had you know mm-hmm. or an oophorectomy and uh, oh, not even that chemo chemo will put you through oh, menopause right okay a lot of the time yeah. so they were all over the place and that was my first indication that I was like oh. so what is so and so what have you done about that then I've just apologized to boyfriends a lot <laughs> <laughs> and just said listen it's not you <laughs> it's it's been a gradual <laughs> it's a gradual and this to me was true was that you don't stop being sexual and you don't stop being turned on mm. that's nothing to do with mm. it it's just it's just a general dry heat I, uh, general dry <laughs> heat right okay so it's like the desert and so do you then do you come across a, an oasis of lubricant at times in the desert is that yes right? yes and and this is the thing like for me lubricant used to be um it's a fun thing and now it's just a necessity <laughs> Um, <laughs> right. Okay. It's now in the list of grocery items, you know. <laughs> right. And do you use it for like day to day as well, or is it just for sex, or is it just for like walking down the street? Yeah, no. But there are other products that do help mm. with that, and I haven't gotten to that. You haven't gone to that yet. point, right? Yes. No, I have yeah. just. I've been taking it for about two weeks. When I say taking it, I don't mean taking it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Schmearing yes, it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Squirting it, all of that. Uh, and they haven't noticed too much of a difference yet, but it's only been two weeks. So we'll yeah. get back to everybody with Vagina News Network um, as it comes to hand. Vagina News yes, Network. I, I just think that it's something that, you know, like absolutely break the taboo on it. Let's talk about it. Yeah. This is, you know, it is a very real, very common symptom yeah. of menopause. So, yeah, and yeah, I didn't know. I mean, I think... For me, the first time I was hearing about menopause was with Colette, which is a friend of ours in Canada who basically mm. nearly died from bleeding out. So that was the first time I heard about like really extreme bleeding to come from menopause and things like that. And then mm. and then I started to swat up because of that on everything else because, you know, I do extra homework at home. Um, and then that that's how I sort of learned about it all. But Colette was quite a cautionary tale indeed. Now, yeah. do you have a fun fact about menopause for the out-of-the-box section? Look, I don't know it's a fun fact that has a lot of discussion behind it, Um, but I did read up that dogs, considering dogs also have been a big part of our discussion today, that dogs can sense when you are menopausal. And what do they do? I think they might sniff a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Then I feel that I've been menopausal for a long time. (laughs) They're always sniffing around there. (laughs) No, they just basically sense hormonal change. So they do know when you are bleeding, but, you know, they also know when you're menopausal, apparently. So what do they do with that information, though? They might give you extra love. Ah, oh, right. Yeah, okay. they, might, they might be extra sort of snoogly. Right. Do they run away when you shout at him for no good reason? <laughs> 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 I'll be like, Lulu, stop using the royal we. Yeah, exactly. uh, the royal we means something completely different <laughs> for a dog. That's what corgis do. But <laughs> Thank you very much. Maybe I should go into public health as well. Yes, yes, yes. That's where all the good jokes are. Public health. <laughs> Right. Okay. Well, uh, well, thank you very much for gracing us with your presence and being so frank and honest and open. And as I say, a lot of people have had some very devastating times with cancer and obviously you've been through a lot, but I think to turn that into something positive for you, but also to spread the word because that was the whole thing about it was to let as many women know about dense breasts, which we haven't even talked about, looked into dense yeah. breasts, people, we both have very dense breasts, all that sort of stuff is just incredibly important. So I salute you and, I'm, as I say, glad that you are still with us so that we can tour again at some point. And yeah. commiserations <laughs> on your dog. I'm very sorry. And it's yeah. nice to see your face. It's nice to see your face too. I love seeing your face. Ah, thanks, gorgeous. Okay, so we'll see you when we see you. Kaki te, as we say. Goodbye. Bye. So that was me good old buddy old pal, Lana Schwartz. I don't know, I've never said that in my life. 
That was my good friend Lana Schwartz, who has dealt with a lot but come out swinging and smiling, and has a delightful boyfriend of some time now. We didn't talk about that at all, because we shall not be defined by men. But no, he is lovely. So hi, Colin. Thanks for listening, everyone. Stay tuned next week for the gorgeous intelligence that is Miriama Kamo. I just talked to her today, and she was a delight. But please spread this podcast about, spread the word, let everybody know about dry vaginas. And please feel free to donate to my Patreon, as work just keeps Keeps getting cancelled. Oh yes, and a bits flash for Volvo News Network. It's, uh, it got better, but then it got worse again. So I went to my doctor to show her yet again. Here we go. And now I have a referral to a gynecologist and potentially the sexual health clinic who are vulva specialists, because that's what I need to try and figure out what's going on. So I'll keep you updated on that as well. But in the immortal words of the juice queen herself, Pinky Agnew, stay juicy everybody, and I'll see you next time on Showy Overs. Kaki Tang.